so now, you know, despite both having full-time military careers, they grew from zero to eight HMOs in just six months this year. During that time, they've employed their own property manager, the virtual assistant, and they've created systems to allow them to step back from their day-to-day activities whilst turning over a six-figure sum and profiting 5K per month, which is impressive. In addition to the rent-to-rent business, they've got a buy-to-let portfolio, and they've just taken on their first development, which is converting a five-bed family home into a nine-bed boutique hotel, using everything they've learned from and achieved through rent-to-rent. So I'm sure you'll agree that's quite impressive. So hold on to your seats, folks, because you're going to enjoy this ride. Please welcome Lucy and Steph Ingram from Ride Property. So yeah, thank you, Steve, for that incredible introduction. Um, We are genuinely stoked to be here this evening. Um, We were incredibly proud uh, to be invited on to this event. This is the first time that we presented anything like this. So we are a little bit nervous and, um, you know, doing a live is, is very different to kind of pre- trying to present your way in a, present yourselves in a professional way. So, you know, this is our first kind of attempt at that. And um, we've got 25 minutes to, to hopefully kind of canter through and, and share with you our, the ride through our rent to rent journey, so to speak. Um, on the screen, you can see, um, Royal William Yard. So this is actually in sunny, sunny Plymouth. This is the view that uh, I have every single morning when I go and walk the puppies. Um, it's the, the oldest um, group of military buildings uh, built in the 19th century. Um, and yeah, that's our view every morning. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have any rent to rent there yet. Um, but uh, yeah, but we'll, 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 we'll see what happens with that. And then um, maybe one day we'll get something in there. Okay, I'm going to now pass over to Stephanie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, So we thought we'd just start by uh, just giving you a bit of background on who we are. We had a little bit of an introduction there from Steve, but yeah, essentially we are full-time in the military at the moment. We're both in the mighty Royal Navy, the senior service. Um, I'm a Miss Brog. I've done 12 years. Um, My day job is I'm a GP, I'm a doctor. Um, And Lucy uh, has done a bit longer than me. Um, She's done nearly 20 years. Uh, I think she joined when she was about 10. Um, (laughs) uh, But yeah, she's a medical services officer, but she's coming towards the end of her career now. um, And is is hoping to to leave the Navy and go full time in property at some point. Um, how did we find property? Well, well, first of all, we met on a ship and actually we also found property on a ship, weirdly enough. And I'll just tell you a bit more about that. In, in 2018, I um, was lucky or unlucky enough to deploy for 10 months to the Far East, depending on which way you look at it. Um, she was gallivanting around Singapore for yeah. a lot of it, going to the Grand Prix. Yeah, it was, it was disgustingly hard. Um, but during that time, there was long periods at sea, um, and you know you get bored, and and so you find other things that you, you know to get your your head into. And and I picked up a book that some people might have heard of, the Forty Four uh, Property Secrets by um, Mark Mark Homer and Rob Moore. And I opened this book, and I was like, this is amazing. You know, I, I was just hanging off every word, and I rang Lucy from across the world and said, you need to read this book too. And you know, conveniently, she was um, she'd actually just undergone major surgery for a shoulder. She'd been out at the British snowboarding chance with the Navy and had smashed herself completely and had nothing else to do post-surgery except read read these books that I was feeding her. And listen to stories of Steph at the Grand Prix <laughs> in Singapore. <laughs> Singapore. Um, so yeah, that kind of whet our appetite in, into the world of property. But I think the thing was, you know, we spent that pretty much that whole year apart and, and up to then we'd pretty much spent all our kind of um, time together. We'd been weekend warriors, just seeing each other at the weekend and, and not as often as we wanted. And we just really started to look for something else, something that we could do together we could build together um, and we could really buy back some of that time that we missed and, and that ultimately is is what we wanted to achieve through property okay so moving on then to our brand evolution um, and for you know we, we definitely know some people on tonight so hopefully um, you know this this won't be of, of any surprise but but branding's been quite important to us from day one um, you know, we are still in our infancy. We are still very, very, very early on in our journey. But I would like to think that those that have seen us, um, you know, understand what our brand is. Um, for those of you that haven't kind of met us before, um, you know, we 
as you can see from the pictures, you know, we, if we're not sliding down a mountain sideways or attempting to surf uh, down in, in, in Newquay and um, Cornwall and Devon, or we're traveling around, you know, city breaks or out in our, our transporter van, you know, it, that's the kind of life that we live and, and, and they're the passions that, you know, we hold very, very dear. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's about enjoying the ride. And that's our mantra really is, you know, with the shaka kind of enjoy the ride enjoy what you're doing be passionate about what you do and no day will ever feel like it's work and no day will ever ever really feel like a chore some days are you know more difficult than others you know let's be real but that's that's the the mantra that we we, we do hold dear and you know the visions and values that we hold really align with that brand and, and you can see from the picture you know ride property ride lifestyles uh, the mountains in there and it, it just encapsulates you know that feeling for us so a bit about those two businesses then ride property you know that was our main kind of company that we set up about 16 17 months ago now and uh, that's our main buy and hold company and uh, you know we have a small single let portfolio um, and our sister company if you like ride lifestyles um, is something that we created um, only at the beginning of this year really uh, and that was very much our kind of tenant facing property management business um, so at the minute we have our rent to rent in there and and like Steve mentioned you know we've we kind of went from zero to eight um, this year in, in six months. So it's been a whirlwind to say the least, um, but that's our two companies. Um. So moving on to just a little bit about why we chose Rent to Rent. Um, so we kind of split it down into three things really, our passion, our mission and our purpose. And so first on the passion side, you know, we felt that there was a lot um, of, of very tired properties in Plymouth and we really felt we could do something about that. And, 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 and we were quite passionate about just really creating something a bit more than just a place to rest your head. We wanted to create a lifestyle for our tenants, something they could feel that they belonged to. Um, and, and really that was something that we really wanted to bring into our rent to rent business. So next in the middle, the picture kind of um, yeah, encapsulates it really. We wanted to make cash. Um, we wanted to use you know, ride lifestyles as the cash cow to hopefully be able to fund our buy and hold company so we could build assets, we could create assets you know, for that long-term wealth and ultimately the freedom. Um, and, and that was the, the mission from you know, the word go you know, after we did our training um, and... You know, it's. Are we going to talk about training at this point? Uh, no, no. So we'll, we'll go on to that a little bit later. But you know, we, that was very much the you know the, the mission at that point. But what we actually got out of it as well was um, is a hell of a lot of, of real life education uh, and experiences, the highs, the lows, the real tactical details, property management, the tenant, you know, management, relate, building relationships with with contractors, with trades. And, and actually just learning how to, you know, how to build a business, I guess, from, from you know, the ground up. And, and what that has allowed us to do as well is now we can, we, when we've moved on to bigger projects like our development, we've, we've got that knowledge and experience that we can really bring into that and help structure a deal. So that was really, really helpful. I think finally on there, our purpose yeah, our why, we just want to be gallivanting around the French Riviera on a moped. I think that kind of sums it up, really, that picture. We just like, need to figure out how we can get two Frenchies on there. So one on the backpack and one in the little trolley at the front. Yeah, I'm sure the trailer or something. But, you know, we, like I said, we just wanted to buy back time for us. That is ultimately our why. We love travelling. We love adventures. We love enjoying that ride, really. And, and Rent to Rent was just part of that whole bigger picture of what we want to achieve. And, and, and yeah, being on that moped is where it is, really. Yeah. Oops. there we go okay so the story so far um, and I'll, I'll just can canter through this really uh, November 19 um, we actually incorporated Ride Lifestyles January 20 um, we secured our first deal um, 
which uh, again we will actually talk about within our case study. Um, February 20 we picked up the key so in between Jan and Feb we, we again decided to go off to uh, the Alps for a month um, but we were competing for the military so we were actually doing work it wasn't all just play. Um, Steph actually managed to come back for a week and um, she said to do some work um, but man so. managed to pick up the keys to rent to rent number one and uh, started kind of things off uh, and then yeah kind of Fast forward to June, we picked up keys for number three and number four. We then realised pretty quickly that with full-time jobs in the military, um, you know, busy lives, that we needed help and we needed help quickly to be able to scale or even well, think about on. scaling. Sorry, I haven't been on the socials uh, much recently. Um, um, just kind of you got a mute on? Oh, cool. Um, so we realised very quickly that we needed to do that. Uh, we understood the power of leverage of, uh, you know, utilising other people's skill sets. Uh, so we employed our first property manager. Again, fast forward, August 20, and um, we picked up the keys to number eight, um, which, yeah, kind of looking at that, it, you know, it feels like it's been a long year, but then at the same time, it feels like it's been an absolute kind of blink of an eye. Um, and at that point, we had five simultaneous uh, refurbs going on at one time, which I'm sure you know, there's other people, there's, there's you know, so much experience within this room tonight. Um, we'll understand where we're coming from. Um, and yeah, since we kind of got to that eight figure uh you know despite covid we've we've had a 95 percent occupancy so you know we're, we're pretty proud of that um a lot of hard work has gone into that so we thought we'd just like talk a little bit about the operation side of the business and i think you know most people who are in the rent to rent game understand it's kind of a, a game of two halves almost and and there's the kind of landlord facing bit of the business and then there's the tenant facing bit of the business as well and you have to almost put on a different face for both sides of the business so you know how do we approach the landlord bit because that's obviously the first bit that's the bit that you learn on the training courses and you know I don't think there's any you know magic here you know it's not rocket science this this part of it we, we did our no money down um progressive training back yeah. in July 19 was it so we did we did Masopi in May yeah um, 19 and then off the back of Masopi which we, did, we ran to the back of the room yeah. signed up yeah we uh, signed up whole jazz um and then July I think we did our yeah. no money down we came back from that, we decided to get in the van and we went off to France and Spain, drove around for a couple of weeks surfing and just massively brainstorming about how we were going to put everything we'd learned into action. We had our big folder and all that stuff. And then we came on, we really just like ticked off the steps, really. We had that blueprint and we just followed it. Um, you know, we, we started our D2B marketing. Um, we started around September time. Um, the, in the, I think it was the first round actually we got a bite from the, um, the, the, the actual landlord I think it was the f very first round we got our first landlord and yeah. the first phone call actually led to a deal but there was obviously periods of negotiation and really the way we did it we just we just um, persisted um, we just you know we were like a dog with a bone with, with anything that came our way we, we just kept going and kept going and followed up on every lead until it had either expired or we were successful with it. And obviously a lot did expire naturally, um, but, but some did come off and were successful. And it's that whole go for no that, you know, we hear about quite a bit. Be happy with every no you get, because every no you get, it means you're closer to that yes. And that's just really how we looked at it. Don't be afraid of the phone ringing. And we just really looked um, for, you know, every time the phone rang don't be scared we just had our scripts ready which naturally you never follow anyway um you know you, you, we, we just looked forward to those phone calls with the landlord because we knew potentially there was a deal at the end of it and we just kept going with that yeah. i think part of it with the landlord side is, is about nurturing those relationships as much as possible you're never going to get a sign a signed deal on the first phone call so if it goes terribly don't worry because you probably have a number of hits um you know a number of touch points with that landlord after that where you can regain maybe what you lost if you said something stupid on the first one but it's just about kind of that that whole people business side just just being yourself talking to the landlords and and trying to get the best out of the conversations and, and selling the best you really and that's really how we approach that side of it yeah okay so moving on then to the tenant bit so it's probably quite easy to think, you know, and, and, you know, I'm by no means preaching to the converted here, um, but, it, you know, it could be easy to believe that all the hard work is done once that deal is kind of signed, sealed and delivered. Um, but in reality, you know, 
that's the hard work only just beginning um, you know without the tenant bit you've got no business um, and you've got no profit uh, so with regards to the tenant bit um, to be honest you know again on reflection when we were putting this together you know in the beginning we were winging it you know we were making it up as we went along we were flying by the seat of our pants um, and it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that we needed an SOP so we needed a standing operating procedure and you know, we kind of putting our military minds back on you know we needed that structure to come back in to the forefront, uh, forefront. so ultimately we could get that blueprint that could just be picked up and could be run with um, with you know whoever whoever picked it up, and you know that that essentially starts with that kind of good marketing um, and hopefully ends with a good tenant getting in your room. Um, on the screen, you know, to the left of the screen, that's kind of one of our typical leaflets that we got drawn up pretty quickly. Um, I think you just did that on Canva, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we put that together and, you know, we got it out and about as much as possible. Um, we, you know, we had leaflet droppers. Um, initially, we started dropping our own leaflets and whether that's with, you know, these types of leaflets or, um, you know, D2V for buying. Um, and, you know, we'd walk the patches and, uh, you know, we did that first to get, get, get the, you know, get the ground truth, so, so to speak. Um, and then to the right, you've got one of our kind of letting signs there, which we, you know, we pretty much got up straight away um, as soon as we possibly could uh, straight outside, you know, the properties. And, and actually, we ended up getting a couple of deals just from having, you know, the for let sign up, um, which again, you know, it's just kind of getting that message out as much as you possibly can. Um, everyone else's mind space. So, so, yeah, I mean, you know, We've only got 25 minutes today, so we, we can't go into massive, massive details on, on every single bit, but kind of getting that onboarding, um, you know, blueprint together that ultimately when we then instructed and employed our property manager, um, she was able to then pick up and run with. It took us out of the tactical weeds, um, a, you know, a lot, still in them, um, still in them a little bit now, but a hell of a lot more out of them than we started. And and actually, we're just going through the process of hiring our second property manager. Um, so again, that whole system is just continually being uh, tested, adjusted, refined, and made better, and and hopefully more efficient, which is what we want. But I think you know ultimately you're getting that good SAP for your tenant onboarding, um, you know, all the way from the marketing, all the way to, you know, the viewing, getting them in, doing the referencing, all that stuff. Um, but ultimately when it comes to kind of putting tenants in your room, you know, you, you absolutely need to be uh, listening to your gut as well in our experience. And on, you know, in the same breath, you can have the best SOP in the world. You can have the best gut in the world and every now and then, you know, a bad egg is, is going to potentially fall through. And that's just something that you have to just learn to deal with and, and get people like Des um, <laughs> in your network to help you out when that goes wrong. So we thought we'd just um, spend just one slide just looking at the, the, the finance side and um, just how we set up our accounts. It's not something that people often talk about. I found um, that often, but I'm quite interested in the sort of budgetary side of things. Thank God you are. <laughs> <laughs> like a good spreadsheet and all that. And, that, you know, there's various models out there. Some people may just have one account, two accounts. Some people I've heard have five, seven accounts in their banks. But we kind of settled on this three account model. Um, and we found it's worked really well for us. It's just a very clear, clean way of operating. It helps with the, you know, accounting, the receipts and all that side of it. And the accountant loves it too. <laughs> so if you want to please your accountant, it's a really good way of looking at it. But essentially, we start with our operations account. That's the main account. Um, we have all incoming rents into there. We have all bills going out of there, all our cleaning, our marketing, just the general expenses um, goes in and out of this account. So it's where the bulk of the money is kind of turned over. We then off that have um, the maintenance account, which essentially is what it says on the tin, all repairs and maintenance, um, any fur uh, uh, furnishings, any renewals or replacement all come out of this account. And what we try to do is move across about 10% of our incoming rent, our gross rent into this account. And what it allows us to do is then track what we're spending on maintenance per month. If we've spent that 10%, why have we spent that 10% by the middle of the month? Where's it gone? And it just gives us a really good overview of what we're actually spending money on. And then when it comes to profit on the left side there, I've come to it last. It's definitely the most important thing. Everyone's heard it before. 
always pay yourself first and, and this is absolutely key in rent to rent when that income in rent comes in you have to pay your profit into your profit account first because if you leave it till the end of the month you know there'll be no profit left so you absolutely have to get into the um the routine of putting that profit across into the profit account and occasionally you may have to dip into it and that's life particularly in the early stages of the business when you're building it but it's so so important you pay yourself first um, so i just thought it'd be really it was really useful just to touch on on how we do that Okay, so systemization. Um, so, you know, again, we, you know, we're within our first year of doing this. So we are, we are by no means the experts at all. This is just in, in the, the world of, of Lucy and Steph and how we've done things. Um, but systems, again, you know, kind of re referring back to my point before, you know, we have both got full time jobs in the military. We do have a busy life. And without systems, it would just, you know, it would just be unmanageable um, and we certainly wouldn't ever be able to really grow. Um, so really early on, you know, we, we kind of um, took on board the power of um, software and apps um, property management um, software that we use and and I know there's loads out there and um, we did use GoTenant initially great platform just didn't really fit our needs and we didn't really feel like we got the best out of it and um, so we actually transferred across to um, Podio and um, so we use Podio is a platform, we use it for lots of things. Um, we find the utility of, of Podio excellent. Um, it's kind of limitless, you know, you can build apps, um, you can use it as a, as a, as a filing cabinet, um, you can you know, make yourself paperless, you can use it as a CRM. It's, it's endless and you can build something completely bespoke to your business. Um, we have uh, we subscribe, so we pay a subscription to a property management software, which is a bespoke package that's uploaded to Podio. Um, we pay thirty pounds a month to, uh, for that. It's called the Engine Room. For those of you that may have not heard of it, um, and what we really liked about that, and again, it kind of uses adopts the same principles as Podio, where you can you know you can build extra things onto it, so it doesn't necessarily just have to be you know the the, the basic package. You can make it fit um, where you want to make it fit. Um, but what we quite liked is no matter how many properties you have or how many rooms you have, that subscription fee never changes. Which um, you know with with quite a lot of those platforms, it does, and it increases as you take on more properties or if you use you know functions like text messages and uh, viewings uh, calendar viewings booking ins and stuff like that it increases so we we really like that um, in terms of apps we um, in terms of kind of task management apps which I think is our second most important bit of um, you know bit of tech that we that we use to systemize is Trello uh, I know lots of people definitely would have heard of Trello and I'm sure lots of people use it in this uh, virtual room that we're in now uh, we started off with Asana and um, to begin with um, which you know we, we you know we did really like Asana. But again, we just felt like Trello, um, the utility of Trello, kind of met our needs a little bit more. Um, so again, it's you know task management app system. Um, we have our maintenance team in there. We have our VA in there. We have our property manager in there. Um, so we you know we use it to track, to assign tasks, to you know kind of prioritize those tasks, give them a deadline, color code them, uh, create separate boards where you can have separate people. Um, and again, you know, the um, the function of that is is vast. Um, so yeah, they're the two main bits of kind of tech that we thought we'd share with you that we use. I think um, if we ever lost Trello, or, you know, the cloud <laughs> exploded or something, that we'd probably have to give up property. We just wrap. Don't know what. But then all our personal lives are in it as well, so we'd probably yeah. have to give up on them as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the second um, the second point that I'll just touch on really is, is kind of growing the team um, and absolutely for, for systemization and, and for scale, scalability of the business, you, you, you have to absolutely look at growing that team and, you know, essentially getting out of your own way Um as early as you possibly can um, and sorry my French just started snoring it's put me off my game oh, I'll just zone out um, so yeah so we you know we understood the power of leverage utilizing other people's skill sets very very early on um, you know I, I think I read a book by Rob Moore life leverage quite early on in our kind of property journey and, and again that reiterated a lot of really kind of important points um, that we pulled out of that um, but yeah essentially kind of 
growing people, growing the team. We got a VA very, very early on to help us with our kind of social media and getting our message out. And, you know, she could help with some basic, simple tasks, um, admin tasks in the in the beginning, you know, even just like simple things like messaging out prospective um, tenants on spare room, you know, just trying to kind of just, you know, outsource as many of those little jobs that take up so much time, which when they start to add up, it's, you know, it's just, there's only so much time in the day. Um, so we got the VA very early on um, and then we then, and kind of switch focus um, and we thought like we need to get a property manager because there's no way that we can you know ever make this passive or even remotely passive if we just continue to do this and you know we're reading a book at the minute well, you've already read it I'm currently reading it it's the cash flow quadrant it's the it's one of the Robert Kaizaki books um, and it's kind of all about you know the left side of the quadrant to the right side of the quadrant the left side of the quadrant is all about that kind of self-employed mentality the employee mentality on the right side of the quadrant you've got you know that business owner mentality and you've got that investor mentality and you know you're only ever going to be on that right side of the quadrant thinking that way if you are able in terms of business to be able to step away from your business and it not to crumble and you're only ever going to be able to do that if you've got a team underneath you so we we jumped on on that as, as soon as possible and we will you know we are already looking at other kind of areas at which we can start to outsource and grow the team i think the thing just jump building on that is is people worry a lot about when you know when's the right time to do it you know i'm not earning enough profit yet to pay somebody else but that's where you have to get out of your own way and think well actually there is an investment like with these sorts of things and even though it might be painful at that time to employ someone that's probably the right time because you know in the long term that's not going to allow you to do this and build your business i don't know if people can see me doing this <laughs> i can't see you um but but that's going to give you that thing that unlocks the, that growth of your business because if it's just you in that linear path you're never going to be able to scale and um, so it's about taking that maybe dip in profit at an early stage and, and and noticing that actually that's the right thing for you in the long term to be able to grow um, so yeah moving on to the last two and they sort of link together really um, and, and key lock system feeds into that 24 7 service um, so the key lock system um, you know it just builds on what Lucy was saying really about you know making it as passive as possible and it's you know it sounds like an absolute no-brainer and, and people that have got HMOs you know are probably you know all over this stuff um, but, but it may be something you haven't thought about if you haven't got your first property yet it's something you actually absolutely have to get in place you know on day one that you pick up your keys you've got to get that key lock system put in because otherwise every single time something happens at that property you have to be there um, and you know whether it's doing the refurb uh, whether it's you know getting a delivery you know accepted which is very frequent when you're doing refurbs and then when it comes to tenants you know viewing tenant well not viewings but 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 once your tenants are in they lock themselves out all the time um, and and so it just really makes your life easy it's so simple but it's so easy to, to kind of put into place and there's no there's numerous different methods you can use and um, we just use a very simple analog system in our rent to rents um, but there's more kind of glorious glorified and more expensive versions you can put in as well um, and yeah, like I said, feeds into that providing that 24 seven service, you know, we all go into rent to rent generally because we want to, to have some sort of passive kind of income. But you know, if we don't get it right, we ultimately end up being full time landlords. And that is exactly why we didn't go into it in the first place. Um, so, so really what you want to do quite early on is work out how you can provide a 24 seven service without actually making yourself available 24 um, seven. And, and the way that we did that, and ultimately it comes back to you know you want a job you know at the time you want to be working but tenants live in the properties all the time um you know they live there at midnight and one o'clock in the morning when something goes wrong even if you're in bed so what we wanted to do there was just find a way you know relatively early on that wasn't overly expensive that would allow us to provide that out of our service and just very simply we just set up a voicemail service um and, and essentially if something happens out of hours it clicks clicks into the voicemail at about 5.30. And when a, when a tenant rings with a problem, it just goes to voicemail, they leave a, a voicemail, it gets transcribed to an email which alerts us, and then we can triage those problems that happen. So if it happens late at night, and we look at it and it's a bulb that's gone out, then we can probably wait till the next day, but actually if it's a lockout, or you know, there's three meters of, of uh, water in the bathroom, it's probably something we want to attend to a bit sooner or get somebody on to. Um, so dead simple again, but really allows us to, to sleep easy. And I think that kind of just goes back to that kind of communication piece with, 
you know, with your tenants as well. So you know, we have WhatsApp groups, um, which our we've actually now stepped out of our WhatsApp groups, and our property manager com- like runs them completely. Um, within the WhatsApp group, you know, in the description bit, we have a web link that um, directs straight back into our Podio system. So if there's a maintenance issue um, within the properties, which is frequent. Um, yeah, there's a web link in the WhatsApp group that they can go on, they can click, it goes straight through to a web form, they, they type out um, what the problem is. And doing that, it reduces down a lot of that traffic as well that we found because actually for a tenant to then think, oh, I've got to, you know, put a maintenance form in, you know, I, I might not, I might just change the light bulb myself, <laughs> you know, like the, the you know, the, the, the tasks, the, the, the definitely the self-help tasks have gone away, which is, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, that, that web link just goes um, straight into our Podio system. And then again, we can just triage the problem appropriately. Uh, we can assign our maintenance team onto that uh, maintenance issue. And again, it's just kind of making it um, paperless uh, and, you know, just kind of systemizing it. But I think it's just, yeah, that communication bit of, to the tenants of exactly what that routine is that you've got, you know, what number that they ring outside of hours. And, um, you know, like Steph said, we've got the work phone that when our property manager clocks off, that then goes into a 24 hour system, which ultimately we still get. So we still pick up those calls um, at one o'clock in the morning if it's an emergency. But, you know, the next the next kind of point from there will be, you know, we've got someone that does the night shift and then ultimately we can, you know, if it's a one in three system, we can ultimately, you know, try and step away eventually. So, yeah, that's that's our systemization um, in a medium sized nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so moving to, to sort of the end, really, this is the, the sort of penultimate slide. Um, and we we're just going to chat about a bit of a bit about what we're going to be doing in 2021. So apart from kind of complete world domination, um, you know, we are very much going to continue to build uh, the investor um, database. We're going to continue to uh, pipeline uh, opportunities in our area. Um, there's a lot of kind of commercial to resi um, that's going to be coming up very soon in our area in, in Plymouth um, that we are you know, keeping an eye on. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work and we're still kind of getting out and viewing and, and we, you know, we're, we're, we're still we're hungry for deals. Um, you know, we have some investors that, that, are, that want to work with us. Um, so you know, we are kind of building that, that kind of pile of opportunities up at the minute. Um, you want to talk about the buy to let yeah so you know one of the things that we're actively doing at the minute one of our buy to lets uh, long-term long-term ish tenants have just moved out so we thought we'd just take a punt in the SA strategy why not um, it works well where the property is there's definitely a market for it um, and and so we just we just fancied having a little look at the SA we did a bit of exploring and, and you know we are confident it will work so we're just refurbing that property at the minute we think it will probably come online around early 2021 January February time and we're just doing all the background work to try and set up all our systems our channel managers and etc for that yeah um the next thing that we're looking at um you know the big thing for us hopefully in the first quarter of 2021 is uh, Steve already alluded to it in his amazing introduction of us is is our is our first kind of development project so we um, we've sourced a, a five bed fam- family house it's absolutely massive and it's huge uh, we've got a good deal on it um and then we are looking to convert that to an eight bed uh, all on suite luxury HMO um, which again is in a really good area um, in, in Plymouth that the target audience that we want it's in a prime location um, you know um, we're really excited about that because you know we've had a big year of rent to rent we've learned lots of things which we'll, we'll kind of move on to some of those in a second but you know we we're looking forward to um, you know, getting our own baby up and running, and uh, Investor Finance, uh, Investor Funds uh, has funded that purchase, um, which again, you know, was a first for us, going really well so far. So yeah, we're we're happy, but we're learning all the time. It's you know, this is our first development, you know, first interaction with you know, kind of architects, you know, drawings, elevations, um, you know, a new build team, um, you know, and all the other things that kind of come into that commercial finance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's um, um, yeah, we're excited and we've got a really good vision of what we want to kind of um, provide in that area. We really want to push the rental market um, for, for luxury HMO. 
and then yeah i guess really the last thing um that is something that we are kind of considering uh we've we've been asked um you know quite a bit recently you know if we would be taking on any mentees and um, not something at the minute um that we have agreed to because in our eyes we'd have to you know be given absolutely 100 percent of our time and effort to somebody um and it certainly wouldn't be very many people but it's something that we are oh, cons- the puppies at the moment. yeah we are we are considering it in the in you know kind of towards the early to mid of next year so yeah we're excited about that um yeah, the case case study that we wanted to present this evening was um, our first deal. Actually, um, I actually we 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 argue over if it was the phone, first phone call or the second phone call that we took. Um, I think it I think it was the second, um, and it and it actually went to voicemail, which I guess everyone can resonate who's been through that initial process of kind of getting your script in front of you, um, dreading that the phone is going to ring, what you're going to say, um, that you're going to hopefully not sound like a complete idiot. Um, so this this landlord rang, and he actually I was at work, so I missed the call, um, and he left an answer phone message, uh, which I was really really happy about because I got to listen to the answer phone message first. I got to digest what he said, take a breath, um, and then think about my answers when I rang him back. Um, But yeah, one of the things that he said on the call was, I've got a property, um, it's a pretty big property, it might be bigger than you want. Um, So uh, at that point, we were were intrigued. So the property that you can see on this picture here, on a rare sunny day in Plymouth. Yeah, on a rare, on a rare sunny day in Plymouth. Um, it's not grey and overcast. This is, I mean, actually the picture doesn't do this justice. This this house is absolutely humongous and it goes all the way back. It's absolutely massive. Um, and it's actually split down into three separate dwellings. Um, so you've got unit A, which is on the bottom, um, which will go into each um, unit separately. Uh, you've got unit B on, on, the, on the middle ground and then at the top you've got units C. Um, so completely separate dwellings, um, although the same supply, uh, supplies for the whole building. Um, and again, just a little bit of context, I won't drag out the points too much. Uh, the landlord wanted us to take over this property um, in its in its entirety, um, which at the time it was fourteen beds. Um, it was our first deal. Uh, we weren't overly keen on taking it over as our first deal um, as a whole. Um, so what we agreed and negotiated to do was to take it over in a staggered um, manner over a couple of months, essentially. So that first deal that we took over in the February. Um, was unit B, so it was the middle floor. Um, he wanted us to take over that first because that he, he had essentially no tenants in that in, on that floor. Um, we then took over the bottom floor in March, um, and then we took over the um, top floor actually a couple of months later because that was already tenanted uh, on a single let basis. He was quite happy to let that run, um, so we took that over in September time. So. So that's the property. Um, it's on a beautiful street in Plymouth. Um, nice, you know, kind of setback, leafy street. Private parking on the front, which is actually a bit of a steal in that area, um, and um, nice big rooms, which you'll see as we move through. So we took over um, Unit B, which was that middle floor. Um, that was the first one. We actually wanted to take over the bottom and work our way upwards, but the landlord was really keen that we took over the middle one first. I think he had more tenants downstairs and was getting a bit of rent there. So this was more empty. So we wanted to offload this one first. And you can see from some of the before pictures, I mean, it's just your typical tired property. You know, the top left, you can see a a rubbish old bed, a bit of a kind of dark and dingy room, um, the kitchen on the bottom left, you know, it's relatively new probably in the last few years, but but it was just a bit lacklustre, a bit boring, no real colour, um, ju- just generally quite dark and dank really through the property. Um, you know, the sofa there, which is it's actually um, a kitchen diner sort of room, um, there's just a sofa thrown in the middle of the room, no real effort put in. Um, so it was quite um, a blank canvas, really, I guess. Um, you know, we, we just, um, the main thing we actually did was just to, to get rid of all that old property and, and just give it a real refresh, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see from um, some of the furniture that we put in the bedroom, it was just really about, you know, putting those simple rent to rent touches on um, new furniture, new bed, you know, nice big, um, what do you call them, beds, divan bed. 
a uh, bit of artwork on the wall, um, nice. blinds on the windows, um, of which we actually overspent, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, new new lights. Um, I guess you know, in the in the in the what do you call it bathroom, um, we put some new flooring down. We gave it a nice deep clean. Mm-hmm. You know, put a few furnish furnishings out for the photos. It was just really simple stuff. Um, in the kitchen, you know, marketplace, we got that table and chairs. It was a almost brand new glass table and chair for about 30 quid so just really simple stuff getting things at a discount um but yeah that that was kind of our first um unit really we definitely did overspend on this unit i think we just went a bit mad in certain areas really not knowing what we didn't know and you know for example putting in bespoke blinds on every single window um almost um we didn't need to do that we could have just got off the shelf or we could have put up curtains yeah. which which we did learn from yeah. you can't um, probably appreciate from the pictures that you know that's probably one of the smallest rooms in that particular property that you know there was you know it was actually a, a six bed property sorry, to start yeah, with mention, yeah. um and we there was two of those bedrooms that were really kind of on the on on the mark really of, of when you know, they, whether they were suitable or compliant and um, so we ended up knocking down an internal wall which again i think we underestimated the amount of work involved in that and um, there was a lot of electricity like kind of complications that came out of it and um, again just kind of our inexperience really um, of, of, of potential problems that were going to come but you know again on the plus side we did end up with a you know a really big room and um, that it was you know our most um ex, you know um expensive room in that particular property um but yeah that taking the taking the wall down uh, was was a lot and like steph said the bespoke blinds you know kind of vertical blinds uh, roller blinds that we'd had measured you know we, we spent too much on that uh, in you know in hindsight mm. uh, yeah moving on to unit a so we took yeah so we took over the unit b in february we turned it around in a couple of weeks um we then moved on um to unit a we actually picked up the keys a little bit earlier than march unofficially and um, the landlord let us go in a little bit early um so this was downstairs um again nice big rooms this particular property well there's, there's kind of a little bit of a funky room down on the left that you'll see there a bit quirky um this was a four bed that we turn into a five bed. So you can see from the top right hand um, pictures, uh, there was a separate lounge and there was a separate diner. So there's two reception rooms um, and a humongous um, kitchen. Something we didn't mention before, the whole building used to be an old nursing home. Mm. Um, so it's absolutely ginormous kitchen downstairs, which is a really good USP for this particular floor. Um, but yeah, two reception rooms. So we turned one of those into a bedroom. So we turned it into a five bed. Um, you know, and again, kind of s- small touches really that we did to the property, not a massive amount. And, and it, you know, it still, you know, shocks me how much you can just transform a property by just getting a really good clean team in there and doing a deep, deep clean on the property, doing the windows, doing the skirting boards. You know, if there's any little touch ups, do them. If you've got the budget to repaint the whole property, great. If you haven't, you know, just do what you need to do to get the margins that you need to get. Um and, you know, we'll talk about a couple of the lessons learned from, from these particular projects in, in, in a further slide. But, you know, we didn't do a massive amount. You know, we put some curtains up. Um, we, we freshened it up. It was the refresh rather than the refurb, getting rid of all the old crappy furniture. Um, and, yeah, just, just freshening it up, really. I think one thing just to, to and we didn't really realise this at the time, but because it had been a nursing home, every single room had a sink in it. And we didn't kind of spot that as a kind of uh, benefit when we were sort of looking around the property initially. But it's a massive selling point for rooms, actually. You know, it's not quite an ensuite. Um, but when there's not, you know, loads of bathrooms, um, actually tenants really do like just having a sink. And so we just put some under sink storage in. And every tenant seemed to comment and go, ah, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And we're like, oh, OK. Um, so, yeah, that was actually really handy. And I think it's probably worth saying as well, you know, realising kind of quite early on where you want to put yourself or, or, or pitch yourself in the market. Um, we always knew, you know, with, with these first properties, you know, the state that we took them over in, the budget that we wanted to try and keep to um, and what was already on the market. 
Um, you know, we've got some big providers down here in Plymouth that have just got that economy of scale that we're always going to struggle, especially in our first couple of deals while we're still learning, making mistakes. We were going to struggle to compete with that top, top end. So we we said straight off, you know, we, we wanted to try and, because there's a lot of crap you know in Plymouth a lot of rubbish on the market and um, you know I'm sure it's the same in any city that we just wanted to be the top of that middle third um, and we could be competitive in that market and you know not only you know what what we do say is you know we, we potentially could be beaten on price but what we won't be beaten on is service and, and that's what we kind of pride ourselves on and you know that's very much one of our kind of you know, values that we hold with, within the company really. I think just and sorry to go off on another tangent with that, but but when you say you you know you you provide excellent customer service, what that doesn't mean is when a light bulb goes, you're going to be around in five minutes to fix it. But what it does mean is you're going to acknowledge that very quickly, and you're going to tell them what you're going to do, and you're going to give them a plan, and you're going to give them constant communication throughout that problem, just so that they know that your problem, their problem, has been acknowledged, that you're listening to the tenant, and that you're dealing with it. So you know we originally thought that we had to be that immediate response um, to whatever problem came actually you, you soon learn that that's not really what tenants want they just want to be listened to and know that their problems are being dealt with yeah and it's not sustainable to you either to be to run around and change yeah. light bulbs like every five minutes yeah should we move on yeah move on and um, so we've talked about unit b we've talked about unit c a rather so the last unit that we took over was in september it was kind of august september time uh, this is when we pretty much had about five simultaneous reverbs going on um so yeah we ran out of time to take the photos um there was there's some definite pros um in this particular um uh hmo it, it was a three bed flat big big flat um at the top like you saw on the picture um but actually, you know, we turned it around very, very quickly. Another reason why we didn't get manage to get in and get any photos. But um, one of our existing tenants had met a partner and wanted to expand, wanted some more space, wanted to stay with our company. Um, so she was willing to take over that whole unit at the top um, for a very, very good you know, price. Um, so we essentially have only got one AST up there. They, they've got the whole run of, of, of that particular dwelling. Um, so from a management point of view, that's very, very easy for us. Um, and it's actually one of our most profitable units. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't get any pictures of that, um, but it profits well. Yeah. <laughs> so that makes it all right. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to just the numbers, because everyone likes a good set of numbers, don't they? And, and so I'll just try and walk you through this um, as, as quick as I can, really, because I know we're running low on time. But but just on the gross rent front, front and, and this will be nowhere near the, you know, the people that live in London who, who charge double our rents. But but Unit A, um, it's currently actually a six bed, just to mention, we did put an ensuite in one of the downstairs rooms, which allowed us to increase our license to six. So so now that gross is at about 2,315. So it's only five beds but we've got six occupants in um unit b be a bit less unit c which is the one that that we did pretty well because there's just two people living in that on a, on a single ast that's a, a great rent for plymouth yeah. um so the total gross is just over five and a half k a month and it's worth saying on on the unit c they pay their own council tax as well we um as i mentioned on the on the intro slide one supply um supplies the whole building which again from a management point of view for us is is really quite yeah it makes it quite makes it easy um, or easy uh, so yeah but with that particular um ast on the top floor they pay their own council tax but we um still obviously provide their utilities and wi-fi so just looking at the refurbs we did say we overspent on unit b you can see there that it was significantly more than unit a and really it should have been about the same mm -hmm. um, but we took so much that we learned into from unit b into unit a our second project and we clearly delivered a much a much more um, cost effective cost effective refurb on that yeah. one and then unit c was was just a few bits and pieces really so the total money we spent was 15k just there or thereabouts the guaranteed rent that we negotiated with the landlord it was kind of staged it increased as we took on more properties so we currently pay the landlords about two and a half k a month the operating cost for us sits at about 12,000 nearly 13 1200 1200 nearly 1300 um now actually when you look at that per head it is about 100 pounds per head now that does sound like quite a lot and it is a lot more actually than some of our other properties 
we, we do include in our operating costs everything like the HMO license split per month, you know, over the five years. We include things like our EICRs. Um, so we do include everything in our, our operating costs. I think it is important to represent that. But a couple of things, the boiler itself is quite expensive to run because it is one big, huge industrial boiler for the whole property. We did overspend on our EICRs. Um, we, we actually, you know, in retrospect, we, what we do now is we put that into the contract, the management agreement that the landlord pays that rather yeah. than us. Yeah. This was our first agreement. We, don't, we didn't do that on that. Um, so we ended up paying three separate EICRs, which, which weren't that cheap. Yeah. Especially um, with the consuming units of that particular property because, you know, it was all singing or dancing because it used to be a nursing home. And, and yeah, so it was, um, yeah, quite a bit of money for the EICRs. And finally, on the operating costs, we realised um, that the, the, the bottom floor, um, that we went around one day and every single room was using an electric heater and they were also drying their clothes with an electric dryer yeah. in every single room. Yeah. So I think that might have contributed to the operating costs. The electricity bill was in the hundreds one month. Um, so it, so uh, it did kind of skew our figures yeah. a little bit and hopefully we've got on top of that now. But that profits at, um, yeah, 1700 there or thereabouts. Um, and, and what that means is that, um, you know, we're roughly going to get all our money back out in, in about eight and a half months yeah. um, for that kind of infinite ROI from there or that from there onwards. You know, not quite the six months that we, we all try and achieve, you know, if you go off the sort of six month model. Um, but I think for our first project and it being a big project and kind mm -hmm. of winging most of it, <laughs> you know, back of a fag packet type stuff, uh, you know, we were, we were fairly happy with that eight and a half month turnaround. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is the last slide. Um, minutes for you. To and and it, yeah, this is essentially the lessons that we learned. Um, are you going to kick off? Yes, it's me, isn't it? It's the first one. So, so I think, you know, um, it's, it's kind of the Richard Branson approach, I guess. But, you know, for us, the answer is always yes, what's the question? And I think that's kind of true most of the time. You know, everything is an opportunity. Always look for opportunity. You know, where there's challenges, opportunity. And, you know, this was a 14 bed or so property. And really the obvious answer was no, but we were just like, should we just do it? How hard can it be? See what happens. Um, so we did. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's just kind of how we've approached most of what we do, really. Yeah. And um, the second point, that, you know, we thought was a really important point. It was, you know, be yourself um you know truly just be yourself you know everyone you know says you know, says it this is a people business property is a people business uh, and i think you know something that we kind of you know made sure that, that we kind of kept to is you know we've been transparent we've been honest and you know even if that's with landlords when we were kind of first starting out and we still consider ourselves as just starting out um that you know we're not the experts we've you know we've made mistakes we you know we're not trying to pretend we're something we're not um, and i feel like that's kind of really helped us to build you know some really solid kind of relationships as we've gone through uh, and that, you know that's not just landlords that's kind of you know experts within within the property community um, of you know other investors and um, trades um, and and you know we're hoping to potentially you know, do a few JVs with our builder um, and again you know we were quite open about the fact that this development is very much our first development but you know we've struck up a really good relationship he sees you know the, the drive and the work ethic that we've got and you know he he's you know he's keen to do something with us in the future so yeah I think it's just be be yourself Moving on to the, the next point. So this is just about the budget, really. So rent to rent, really, is it's not about, um, you know, you see these beautiful, beautiful HMOs on, on social media. Perhaps you're not going to get there with a rent to rent because the budget just doesn't stretch. You've really got to stick to that six month budget, work it out from the beginning, use your deal analyzer and make sure you stick to it. We didn't with our first, um, with the first unit, but we learned as we went and we, we got much better at doing that as we went, uh, as we carried on. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is a business. It's got to be sustainable. You've got to do it for a reason. And that is to make a profit um, and, and to grow the business. And, and so it's so, so important that, that, that you do that. And again, you know, a couple of examples that, you know, we may have already mentioned, but just the simple things kind of, you know, putting nice curtains up from Denelm um, rather than bespoke blinds. You know, we probably, you know, spent a third of the amount on the on unit A on the bottom floor than we did in the middle floor just by doing that, you know, not not necessarily using the best vinyl because um, you just get, you know, you can so easily just get carried away. But we learned a lesson from that first deal and we made sure that, we you know, we didn't take those um, mistakes um, into the next one. Um, 
I think something that again when we were putting this together on reflection um you know don't underestimate and you know for people that aren't quite yet there yet or they haven't got their first deals yet you know don't underestimate the, the rubbish removal costs and effort um especially if you're taking on a big old property that's you know it's been maybe let out to students and it's tired and it's got you know a million bits of furniture in every single room like crammed in they're all falling to bits and then you know you've potentially got to kind of get rid of that yourself you know you can and um, which we have done in, in other deals uh, agree to um, uh, kind of replace the furniture um, and not necessarily have to leave the new stuff again that's kind of just you know nuances within agreements that, that's agreed um, or vice versa you, can, you know you can you can take it over empty if that's if that's what you can agree but on certainly on this particular project um, we had a lot of rubbish to get rid of a lot of old rickety furniture that cost us a lot of money uh, I think you know moving forward again we quickly realized that places like marketplace um, is a great place to get rid of crappy furniture you know one man's um junk is another man's gold is that the right saying treasure is something like that um but you know we you know all the recent refurbs that we've done you know, we pretty much got rid of all of the furniture and all of the properties for nothing and um, just by kind of following that model um and actually some of the furniture you can get a couple of quid for it, it can go back into the pot um so yeah, so that's that's um, that's def- definitely a lesson that we learned quite early on. So the the penultimate one there is, is is get your professional photos. There's a couple of properties in our portfolio we just didn't have time, or we just forgot, or what, for whatever reason. But that is your really your only chance. I take that back. It's not your only chance, but it's your best chance to get the best photos because your your property will never look as pretty again. So really take that chance because those photos will last forever and pay dividends forever because you can always just recycle them yeah. on your on your spare room etc you, you may be able to get them later but then you've got to put that effort in later to, to dress your room so so get them when you can and, and i would say actually even off the back of this year and covid and virtual viewings i think um you know not even just kind of getting the professional like swanky photos anymore it's you know take take your camera phone or your gimbal or whatever and get you know, and get the age room looking as, as as great as they possibly can. Get videos of communal spaces. So you know, if if the worst is to happen again, and you're going to be relying on virtual virtual viewings or kind of just you know on that first bit of the dialogue with prospective tenants, just sending through those videos. You know, trying to get them interested. If you've got all the videos stored up, you know, ready to go, it's just going to make your life so much easier. Um, and then the last one, really, just to finish off on, is you know being mindful of scaling too quickly and this is something that you know we feel like this is one of the biggest lessons that we learned Uh, we you know it sounds great to say you know we scaled from zero to eight in six months um you know it looks good on a on a facebook post but in reality you know a it caused quite a bit of stress um but b and the most important point is that we didn't always necessarily learn from each project into the next and especially when we had simultaneous deals going on and refurbs going on we didn't we didn't have the time to you know you know refine and and kind of learn and you know make it better and adjust into the next and there was a couple where we we didn't really do that and we just kept making the same mistakes yeah and and (laughs) and actually if we'd have just taken a little bit more time between each deal it's great to say that in hindsight um you know, I, I don't think we would have made some of the same mistakes. Um, and we'd have less grey hair and wrinkles. And we'd have, yeah, way less grey hair and wrinkles. <laughs>